If your dad's over there, everybody's fine. Welcome this morning to First Baptist Church Somerville. Aren't you glad to be back? I got a question. How many of you are sitting in a seat you've never sat in before? Yeah, amen. All right, okay. That's a miracle, okay? In the Baptist church, people go to their pews, and uh, I've seen some interesting uh, uh, pictures and posts. Uh, one church, uh, they actually took pictures of their members, and the, they, they taped them to the pews. So when the preacher was preaching, he could at least see where people were sitting. But this morning, y'all have messed all of that up. But uh, I want to thank you for your willingness, your cooperation, and, and there are many over in uh, uh, Elliott Hall, too, at this time. And so... Uh, we just appreciate these are unprecedented times, but uh, God's going to lead us through it. Amen. And uh, so I want to welcome you back home this morning and thank you for uh, coming today. Uh, the verse of Psalm 122 verse 1 has a new meaning today, I think, for all of us. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And I pray that uh, you have been. But I want to share with you that today is a day of miracles. The very fact that you're not sitting in your same pew is a miracle. But uh, this morning, Stephen and I, we were talking. We've had some glitches along the way, but uh, hopefully we've got all of that worked out. And we want to welcome those who are watching by live stream and uh, hope that uh, you're having a wonderful day also. But as I walked out front to put one of the signs out to use a certain door, I found something uh, right outside the sanctuary doors on the ground. And this is a light bulb that fell from the canopy over there. And you know how high that is. It did not bust. It landed on the ground. And I said, man, that is a miracle. And I uh, came in, showed Steve, and he said, well, there's going to be a lot of miracles today. And so that's my illustration for today. Uh, God has uh, looked down on this day with great favor. The Bible says in Psalm 107, verse 2, let the redeem of the Lord say so. So would you just say so? So. so? Amen. Join with me as we read Psalm 100. As I thought about this coming back, that uh, what a special time that is, let's, let's listen to the word of the Lord. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all ye lambs. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Do we have some thanksgiving today? 
Amen. Amen. And into his courts with praise. Are we going to give some praise today? Amen. Amen. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. I thank the Lord for the privilege that we have to worship our Lord freely. Now we've had to do it differently over these past 11 weeks. But you know God is faithful. And God has delivered us and God has brought us through. Now I want to give a special word of thanks to many volunteers that have come uh, over these past 11 weeks to help in doing some things and just uh, going through our facilities. I want you to know the carpets, the pews, they've all been cleaned and, and uh, vacuumed. And the same in Elliott Hall, the bathrooms, the hallways, uh, the properties committee, they've been doing a lot of work while we've been out of the physical building over these last 11 weeks. And uh, I hope and pray that you'll just be thankful for those volunteers. So many, I don't want to name them and miss some, but uh, I want to thank all of those who came and worked so hard, especially even this past week in getting ready for today. But I especially want to thank our staff because they have worked tire tirelessly over these last several weeks. We've, like I said, we've had hiccups. But we've been able to tackle them each and every week. And so I especially want to thank Stephen White and Jason Allman because they have gone above and beyond the duty and responsibilities here. Would you join with me in letting them know our appreciation? At this time, we're going to ask our Deacon of the Week, our Chairman of Deacons, Brother Carl McCaskill, to lead us in prayer. And folks, let's get ready to worship our God. Amen. Thank you, Brother Carl, and, and thank you, Pastor, for those kind words. Uh, let me say, I, I love I love my pastor, and if all y'all love him as much as I do, he's in good shape. I, I, I'm thankful and grateful. Yes. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, now, we're not going to stand and sing this week, but I do want you to sing along with me. Jo join with us. We, we begin with How Great Is Our God. Just remain seated. I 
majesty, then all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, it trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. of thanks we're going to keep on singing to god be the glory i know it's not easy for y'all to sit down and sing but i appreciate it we, we don't spray spray all over each other quite so much so <laughs> to god be the glory three stanzas join with me in the ensemble as we sing please the glory, great things he hath done, so loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement. 
truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, to Jesus. The Son and give Him the glory, great things He hath done, great things He has taught us, great things He hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. We'll sing all three of those stanzas uh, before Brother Tommy comes and has our prayer. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me, I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning, then I repented of my sin, and won the victory, oh victory in Jesus, my Savior.
situations that have arisen that have has caused quite a turmoil in our world and especially now in our country with the coronavirus and all of its effects and then as you have been watching on television the unrest and the protesting that has been going on over these past several days it is incumbent that we speak to those things because I think too often uh, we uh, tend to not say things and um, I think it's imperative that we as a church make a statement. And that is simply this. God said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Our land needs healing today. Not just physical health wise, but our culture is in crisis today. And I know there's a lot of different opinions and different things, but we know this. Every life is essential to God because he created life he sustains life and I think we should all be heartbroken anytime someone is murdered killed tragically intentionally or accidentally that life is precious at somebody's son or daughters possibly somebody's mother or father and we need to take each of those very seriously and I know there's been quite an uproar in our world today over the death of an African-American man. And I pray that justice will come down in that situation. Because if we fail to be a country of laws and order and justice, then my friend, all hell does break loose. But we as the people of God have a charge from God that we are to first pray and some have made light of well we need to just stop praying about things no my friend we need to start praying about everything because that's where it starts and that's what he says if my people call by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek God's face and so today I think as we gather back for the first time into our building I think we need to pause for a moment of prayer for God's healing to come upon our land to pray for our leaders to pray for those who are serving on the front lines our health care workers in the battle against the coronavirus but then also for our law enforcement agents all across this world that stand and are all of them perfect no matter of fact I haven't met one perfect person yet have you and so we need to pray and we need to pray for God's healing, for God's calmness, for God's mercy to rest once again on the United States of America. Because if we don't, we have not even seen the worst of what can happen. 
So I've asked uh, Brother Tommy Perkins, if he would, to lead us in a prayer for God's blessing and healing and for his calmness, for his touch to rest upon our land today. Brother Tommy. Well, as I prayed about what would, uh, what do we need to say this first Sunday back? And uh, the Lord led me to this passage of Scripture that I have used this Scripture before here, but God just so impressed that we need to revisit uh, this passage. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Exodus chapter 14, verses 1 through 14, and we're going to read those verses. Now, uh, Stephen didn't want you to stand because you might spray as you sing, but I'm going to read, but will you stand in reverence to the Word of God, and I'll read and um, hear what the Word of the Lord has to say to us today. Exodus chapter 14. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they turn and camp before pi Halareth, be between Megal and the sea, opposite baal Zephon. You shall camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. And I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all of his army, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Then they did so. Now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this, that, that, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Also he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with boldness. So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them camping by the sea beside pi -her before baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And then they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. 
For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Father, I pray that we will draw from this story truths that will help us here in 2020. God, may we listen attentively as your Holy Spirit speaks to us. And I pray for every person that is here in the sanctuary in Elliott Hall or listening by live stream. Father, if they're in need today, they may feel like they're in the wilderness. They may feel like they're in the grips of danger. Father, would you give them comfort? So, Lord, speak to us as we open your word. And, Lord, as you reveal to us your power, your majesty, your glory. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, we have experienced things that we never thought or imagined to this extent. So my message this morning is we have never done this before. Or have we? I want us to think about this story. This is a familiar story of the children of Israel. And as they leave Egypt, you know, they've been in Egypt for a long time. As a matter of fact, that's all that they've known. And then Moses comes on the scene, and now he leads the children of Israel out. And so finally, after great conflict, they they are able to get away. Have you ever felt like you're in the clutches of some authority that just doesn't seem right or unjust you see in these days we have we have been in a situation that we've never been in before quite like this and many people have even questioned can we survive this and I'm sure that's what many of the children of Israel say we can't survive this we didn't know if we could survive the virus we didn't know if we could survive a shutdown of our economy And now we're confronted, can we even survive with the cultural unrest that's going on in our world right now? Well, can I tell you that this story that I've just read to you is very pertinent to where we are today. I want you to look at these two verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The Apostle Paul reminds the Christians at Corinth in verse 6, he said, now speaking of Moses and the children of Israel and coming out in verse 6 he said now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted hey would you agree with me we have discovered that we can do without some things hmm we could have testimony service right there you know this world this world It seemed to revolve a lot around sports. You know what? We found out we can survive without it. Now, we miss it. But I believe that we have, as a nation, made sports an idol. And that's just one of many. Hey, we've sometimes even made our jobs an idol. You you know what this shutdown has done? It has shown to us what's the most important thing of all our life our life you know this is the year what year is this what year is this 2020 what does 2020 stand for perfect vision I believe that God has allowed us to go what we've gone through so far this year to clear up our vision I believe that God is speaking that hey you've not been listening you have not been paying attention and I believe he's saying this to the whole nation and to the especially to the church of God you've not been listening I'm going to show you what is most important and you know what we've been able to live without a lot of things now we miss them but we are existing without them look in verse 11 Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So Paul said, listen, the the Exodus story was important for the people at Corinth back in his day. Can I tell you that this story today is very pertinent to you and I here in 2020? So here's what I want to share with you, the story 
of the Exodus. And, and you know it. If you've seen the, the Ten Commandments, you've seen the movie, you know, where Charleston Heston is, is Moses and he stands there and he lifts up that rod and the sea splits and, and, and they cross over on dry ground. And then when they get the other side, it closes and, and, and people are astonished. They're amazed. I told this before, but some of you may not have heard this story. A little boy went to Sunday school and the Sunday school class was on Moses and the Exodus. He came home and his mother said, son, how was Sunday school this morning? Oh, it was awesome. Had an awesome story. And she said, well, what was that story? Said, mama, you, you're not going to believe this. Said there was a guy by the name of Moses. And he led a group of people out. And they got up to the Red Sea. And there was a mountain on this side, a mountain on this side. And Pharaoh's army came chasing him. And so they were trapped. Nowhere to go. And the mother said, well, then what happened? He said, Moses got on his walkie-talkie. And he called command post. And he said, send me a bridge-building platoon. And they came and they built this bridge over the Red Sea and the children of Israel marched across on the Red Sea. But then when they all got across and turned around, the Egyptian army was following them. So Moses got back on his walkie-talkie and he said, send some bombers and blow the bridge up. And said the bombers came and blew the bridge up and they were all destroyed. And he was proud of the story he told. And the mother was shocked, said, son, is that what the Sunday school teacher said? And he hung his head and he said, no. He said, if I told you the way she told us, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> Can I tell us something today? The reason we're in the mess we're in is because we've not been living a life where the unbelievable is taking place. Because when the unbelievable takes place, there's only one place that can get credit, and that's the Lord. You know why we're in the mess we're in today? It's because we've been trying to figure out everything on our own. So let me give you three quick points out of our text. First of all, I want you to see that there were conflicting decisions by Pharaoh. Conflicting decisions of Pharaoh. Now, Pharaoh was the leader. Now, Pharaoh was not his name. There were many different pharaohs, but it's interesting that Moses, who wrote the first five books of the Bible, uh, t just says pharaoh because, again, it was talking about the position of, uh, of authority there. And it's interesting that, that he had conflicting decisions because over and over, as you read from chapter 5 through chapters 14 of the book of Exodus, and I would challenge you to go home and read those, you will find that Moses interacts with pharaoh numerous times and over and over again. He comes and he says uh, to Pharaoh, God has said, let my people go. Now, it's interesting that in the text that we read, we read where God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And people have struggled with that statement for a long time. But let me give you an insight. God didn't harden his heart until after Pharaoh had hardened his heart several times. Not once, not twice, but many times. And I want us to see that God only did what Pharaoh had been doing for quite some time. You see, because the problem was Pharaoh had an issue with pride. Does anybody else have an issue with that? If we're honest, we all would have to admit we all struggle with pride, don't we? And Pharaoh was in a great position. As a matter of fact, Pharaoh was even in the position where he thought he was God and many others thought he was too. And it's interesting in, in Exodus chapter 5 when Moses comes and stands before the Lord, and he, uh, before Pharaoh, and he says, let my people go. I want you to see, he says this in Exodus 5 too. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Can I tell you, that's the problem of our world today. There are a lot of people who do not know the Lord. Because the truth be known, if we knew the Lord... As intimately as we should, it would make a difference not only in our life, in our family's life, but in our community's life and in our nation's life. You see, there's conflicting decisions. Uh, we're even battling with some of that, aren't we? There's been some, some leaders that have said one thing and then they come out and say the exact opposite. Sometimes it's left, sometimes it's right. Sometimes it's this way and other times it's that way. And how confusing is that? 
But oh, trust us, we've got the answers. <laughs> Uh, I, I've learned one thing. I don't trust anybody anymore. I don't even trust myself. There's only one I can trust, and that's the Lord God Almighty. Because, you see, man has a pride problem. Man says, oh, we can figure all this out. I want you to see that what happened in those ten plagues, and we can't, don't have time to go through all of those, but as those plagues would come, then Pharaoh would call for Moses sometimes and, and say, you know, hey, uh, listen, we need, we need to get relief from all of this. And so God would send relief. Two times we find where Pharaoh actually admits to Moses, I have sinned. It just didn't last. Okay? And that, that was the problem. But we see that the plagues continue on, and, and it even comes to a point to where on that tenth plague, the, the killing of the firstborn, when Pharaoh was brought to his knees. But I want you to see something, and that is this. Pharaoh, even in that, still wrestled with pride. How could I have let these people go? How could I have done this? And so what we find is he just, he keeps flip-flopping back and forth with his decisions. You know what James says? A man who, who is double-minded is unstable in what? All of his ways. I mean, Pharaoh was all over the place. He says, no, I'm not going to let you go. Then he says, well, you can go, but just don't go too far. Then he says, no, you can't go. Well, then I'll let you go, but, but you can't take your flocks with you. Well, okay, well, then you can, you, you can now go. As a matter of fact, now I just want you to get out of here. But then he changes his mind again. We read in, in Exodus chapter 14. And, and notice that he says that the Lord hardened his heart, but it's only because he had done it so many times. And notice what he says. He even comes to a point that he says, why have we done this, that we have let Israel go? They have let nearly a million slaves go. I mean, they were slave laborers. And he just let them go. And so now, oh, what are we going to do? And so now he changes his mind. And his pride led him to anger. And anger uncontrolled leads to blind rage. And we're seeing some examples of that today in our country. Just blind rage. Some of these protesters, they don't even know what they're protesting. I mean, I've seen some interviews of some. It, it's, kind of the, it's kind of the group mentality. I, I would to God that Christians could get that excited and passionate over him. If we could, we could make an impact on our world. So Pharaoh, what does he do? He gets all of his chariots, he gets all of his horsemen, he gets all of his captains, and they chase him down. You see, the problem with pride is pride leads us to the point of thinking we've got it all under control. And Pharaoh did. Well, I'm going to take all my chariots and we're going to get them, we're going to bring them back. You know what the Bible says? The wise man said in Proverbs 16, verse 18, pride goes before destruction. And twice in Proverbs, it's the exact same verse in 14, 12, and 16, 25. There's a way that seems right unto man, but the ends thereof are death. And Pharaoh, man, he, oh, I'm, uh, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do Listen, conflicting decisions will bring nothing but turmoil in our life. But secondly, I want you to see the complete despair of the people. The complete despair of the people. As, as you see, they get down there and they're camped by the, the sea. There's a mountain on either side. The Pharaoh's army is behind them. The sea's in front of them. What are we going to do? And notice what the Bible says in verse 10. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And listen to what they said. Moses... Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt so with us? To bring us up out of Egypt. In this not the is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. Now, can you imagine that statement? But before we're too harsh on them, let's remember something. That's all they knew was serving the Egyptians. That's why they were brought up. It had been that way for generations. But notice what they're saying. Why didn't you just leave us alone? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. You know what's interesting is back several chapters earlier, they're all crying to, out to the Lord for deliverance. God gave them what they asked for. Deliverance. Now they have come 
out of Egypt. They saw and witnessed the ten plagues. Now they're at the Red Sea. Now it looks like an impossible situation. <clears throat> Nothing is impossible with who? I said nothing is impossible with God. You and I have got to learn that sometimes God puts us in position so he can prove himself, and he doesn't have to, but he does so to help us. Our problem is we get in our own way. Pride. And then we get angry. Then we get into this blind rage. And so I want you to see, now they're in a dilemma. <clears throat> and they said, it'd been better if we'd have just stayed in Egypt than to die here in the wilderness. Can I tell you something? <laughs> if they didn't die in the wilderness, they were going to die in Egypt. You know what the end result is? No matter where you're at, whether you're in Egypt or whether you're in the wilderness or whether you're in the promised land, as long as you're breathing and you're a human being, you're going to die one day. I hope I didn't surprise some of you. <laughs> but we're all going to die. Now they're in a point and they think it's over. Well, if they were so excited about going back to Egypt, why didn't they just say, well, let's just go? <laughs> you want to know the sad fact of the matter is? That's what happens a little bit later. There was a group that wanted to. They became afraid. And fear will drive you in the opposite direction of following and trusting the Lord. They began to complain. They began to murmur. Oh, it'd be so much better for us to have stayed in Egypt. Oh, really? What was going on in Egypt? They, they had to make bricks. And because Moses showed up the first time, it made Pharaoh mad. And he said, okay, we, we were supplying you the straw to make the bricks. Now we're not even going to give you the straw. You go get your own straw. It made it even worse. Did they enjoy that? Did they enjoy being ridiculed and mocked and told what to do, being fearful? It made them come to a point of despair. Fear also brings on pity. Any of you ever had a pity party? I know some have during this shutdown. Oh, it's just terrible, just terrible. Oh, man, it just woe is me. Do you know what, my friend? God knows exactly what's going on in your life and in my life. And do you know he's still in control? And do you know he can still supply every need according to his riches in Christ Jesus and glory? Did you know God has been sustaining us through this whole ordeal? Now, does it mean everything's perfect? No. And it's not going to be because we're living in an imperfect world. We're living in a world where there are conflicting decisions from those who are in authority. But it should not drive us to a, a state of complete despair as it did the children of Israel. It even came down to the place where they made false accusations. Now, they just needed to remember where they'd come from. They'd been under bondage to Pharaoh. They had witnessed the ten plagues. And then something interesting happened. Moses told him, said, now, listen, when you leave, go ask your neighbor to give you some gold and silver. Now, I'd like to challenge you to go do that today. <laughs> go knock on your neighbor's door. Hey, could you give me some gold and silver? What kind of reaction do you think you'd get? Do you know what the Bible says? Let, let me just read it. Let me read this to you in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 32, or 35 and 36. Listen to what it says. Now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, and they had asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they granted them what they requested. They plundered the Egyptians. You know an interesting thing I've seen about all the protests and the rioting that's going on and the destruction of businesses and the looting where people are going in and stealing stuff that they do not have the right to, although some of them say they do. They're stealing. They're taking what is not theirs. And, and, and some people even try to justify that. Can I tell you something interesting? If we'll trust the Lord, they did what Moses said to do. If we'll be obedient to the things of God, let me tell you what will happen. You'll get some reverse loot, looting. Reversed looting. They didn't go in there and take it. They went in there and asked for it. And the Egyptians just gave it to them. Said, go, get out of here. <laughs> Leave us alone. Take whatever you want. <laughs> That's totally opposite of what's going on today, isn't it? You know why? Because what's going on today is not of God. 
People aren't trusting God. They're not trusting the Lord. They're not looking to Him for guidance and for direction. And so their despairs continue. As a matter of fact, right after they get across the Red Sea, just let's just fast forward real quick. You know the story. You know how the Egyptians then are killed and, and God delivers them. But I want you to see this real quick. In, Ex in Exodus chapter 16, they come to a place where there's the bitter waters of Merah. They can't drink. And they begin to cry, start crying out again. Oh, Moses, have you brought us here to die in the wilderness? The waters are so bitter we can't drink. And so God performs a miracle. Moses, he, 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 he does what God says. And the bitter waters become sweet. It's not very long. They get to the place where there's no food. There's no food. And, 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 and again, in Exodus chapter 16, we find that they begin complaining that there's no food. Oh, it'd been better if we'd have died by the flesh pots of meat. When we ate bread in Egypt, now there's no food. You know what God did? Yeah, you know, he provided a manna. For how long? For one day? For one week? For one month? No, for 40 years. Then later on in, in Numbers chapter, uh, or Numbers 11, then in verse 20 it says that they said, well man, we remember the fish. Where's the meat? Remember that lady from Wendy's? Where's the beef? Yeah, we got manna, but where's the beef? God sent them quail. And God said, you're not going to have it for a day. You're not going to have it for two. You're not going to have it for three. You're not going to have it for, for, for a week. You're going to have it for a month. As a matter of fact, I'm going to give you so much quail, you're going to get sick of it. And that's exactly what happened. You see, God's people just never were content. It was constant and complete despair, it seemed like, all the time. And then you remember Numbers chapter 14, when they finally get to the place where they send the 12 spies in to view out the promised land that God said, I'll give you. And you remember what happened? They come back and they said, oh, there's giants in the land. And so now they said, oh, Moses, it would have been better if we'd have stayed in Egypt. We're going to get killed here. We're going to get killed by the sword. I mean, come on, folks. What have they witnessed? They saw a miraculous exodus from Pharaoh's rule. They saw an, a, an unbelievable miraculous rescue through the Red Sea on dry ground on top of that. Then God makes the bitter waters sweet. God sends manna from heaven that they didn't have to raise or buy. He then provides for them everything and yet they said, oh, we'd just soon go back to Egypt. Really? You see, there are a lot of people like that today. They said, oh, if we could just get back to where we used to be. Well, friend, I got news for you. I don't want to go back to where we used to be. I want to go to where something that God's even got for us that's better. And we can get there. Now, we're going through some tough times, but can I tell you something? It's not bigger than God. You believe that? It's not bigger than God. And so have we too forgotten what God has done for us? Sometimes we go, oh, Lord, I just don't understand what you're letting it, this, these things go on today. Have we forgotten what God has done? I want you to know, my friend, if you've asked Christ to come into your life and you've trusted him as Lord and Savior, he has forgiven you of your sins. You have been given a passport to heaven for eternity. Come on. Have we forgotten that? Let's just talk about a few other little blessings he's given us. Can you still see? Can you still hear? Can you still taste? Can you still walk? Can you still breathe? My friend, God has blessed us with so much. Do you have a family? Do you have friends? Listen, I want you to know God has given us so many blessings that we need to take the time to thank God for that. And what the world has seen is that we're not satisfied with what God has given us us and we get to that place of complete despair oh I just wish you oh I wish we could just go back to Egypt come on really really but thirdly I want you to see this Moses doesn't get aggravated with him there were conflicting decisions from Pharaoh he was all over the place and then there was the complete despair of the people oh what are we going to do we're afraid oh it would just been better if we'd have died in Egypt then I want you to see a clear declaration from the prophet Look, if you will, in verse 13. And Moses said to the people, and here's what I want us to hear today. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. 
Can I tell you something? In times of crisis and despair, what we need is a clear, strong, distinct voice. Can I tell you something? I am so thankful and grateful for Franklin Graham. I believe that he brought this nation four years ago in that election year to every state capital he went and encouraged God's people to pray. He didn't say who to vote for. He said God's people need to get on their knees and pray. And for the first time in a long time, I believe that's what happened with the evangelical community. Can I tell you something? We need a clear voice today again. And you know what? You know what really strikes me? Is Franklin Graham has national commercials popping up. Have you seen them? where he gives the plan of salvation, where he invites people to trust Christ and even leads a prayer on national TV, commercial spots. Praise God for a clear, distinct voice in a time of despair and crisis. We just need more of them. Matter of fact, you need to be one of those voices. Where you work, where you live, where you go to school. No, you don't have to be obnoxious. No, you don't need to be self-righteous. But you need to give a clear, distinct declaration. God is in control. Do I have the answers? No. Do I know what's the best thing to do? Not, not really as far as specific of things that people can do. But there is one thing that I do know that's specific that we do need to do. And that is get on our face before God and ask for his guidance. And ask for his blessing. So this, this clear declaration of the prophet. Moses says don't be afraid. And isn't that what we need to hear today? There are people that are scared. There are people that are fearful. And, and, and let me just simply say this folks. As the, as the church, as believers, as the Christian community. Let's be careful that we do not judge those who do not act or see or believe exactly the same way we do. There are some of you here today that are wearing masks and some of you who are not. It doesn't matter if that's what you need to do, that's what you need to do. Nobody needs to criticize you for doing it and nobody needs to criticize you for not doing it. That may have hit a nerve, I'm sorry. But you know what we need to do? We each need to do what we feel led to do. Now we have taken steps as a church. You are sitting in clean, sterile seats today. And they'll be clean before next week. We've done everything that we, that we, we have tried to follow the guidelines in such a way to assure you of safety when you come here. But can I tell you something? We don't need to be critical or judgmental of somebody who doesn't quite agree with us. That's the problem of the world today. There's so much criticism, so much judging going on, and it brings fear to people's lives, and it should not be. So Moses, the first word he says is, don't be afraid. Moses, are you blind? Do you not see where we are? Do you not see what's fixing to happen? Do you not see what our circumstances are? Moses, are you deaf and dumb? Moses says, do not be afraid. Paul told young Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Now, you can't just take one of those things out of there. You've got to take all three. He's given us a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind. Okay? So we need to live a life that is pleasing to him. But then secondly, notice what he says in verse 13. Do not be afraid. Stand still. <laughs> Well, we've kind of learned that over the last 11 weeks, haven't we? We haven't been able to get out and do a lot of stuff, and we just had to be still, staying put, don't move. Can you imagine uh, Israel had nowhere to go? When Moses said, stand still, they said, well, where are we going? The sea in front of us, a mountain on either side, the army behind us, there's nowhere to go. Can I tell you something? The reaction is to, when you're in crisis, to run away, to flee, and to, to get away. But God's man, Moses, is saying, stand still, stand firm. And that's why the psalmist wrote in 40, Psalm 46, verse 10, Be still and know that I am God. We need to learn to stand still before God. 
I hope some of us have learned that even better over these last 11 weeks. But then thirdly, watch this. Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord which he will accomplish for you when? Today. Hey, whenever we ask God for something, we want it today. We want it right now. Sometimes it comes, sometimes it doesn't. This promise God says to Moses, he says, tell the people, don't be afraid, stand still, and watch today. And he says this, notice what he said. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. <laughs> you know what that tells me? Don't be afraid, stand still, but watch God work. Hey, watch God work. <laughs> Did they see the salvation of the Lord? Did they? Okay, do I need to start back over? <laughs> Did they see the salvation of the Lord that day? Yes. Oh, they saw it in a way. They didn't, we ain't never seen it this way before. They had never seen anything like that before. All of the countries around had not seen anything like that before. The enemy was totally destroyed. Can I tell you something? That's what we need to get back to. We need to learn to not be afraid to stand still and watch God work. Now, watching God work will not happen until we're obedient to the first two. In other words, we've got to be faithful to what he's called us to do. We can't just sit back and say, okay, God, take care of this situation. No, we need to do what we can do, what he calls us, what he requires of us, what he commands us to do, we need to do, but then we need to step back and watch God fight for us. Notice in verse 14, the Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. I think what he was saying to him is when you see God move, don't stand there and go, get him Lord. <laughs> no, just sit back and watch God work. And God did a mighty work that day. As a matter of fact, the children of Israel saw God do that time and time and time and time again. Remember David, little shepherd boy, comes out and he meets big old Goliath. You remember what he said in 1 Samuel chapter 17 verse 47? David said this, And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord and he will give you into our hands when he was speaking to Goliath. You see, this battle we're in, it's not ours, it's the Lord's. But we need to be obedient. We need to be faithful. We can be outmatched. We can be outnumbered. We can be overwhelmed. And we can see no visible means of victory around us. Can I tell you something? That's his specialty. When you get in that situation, God's ready to go to work. We just have to learn to watch. And stay out of his way. And God can do some amazing things. Remember the battle of Jericho? That whole city fell to the ground without a sword being raised or a fight happening with the people of God. God did that. You remember the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace? God delivered them out of the furnace. Impossible situation. I mean that fire was so hot even the people who threw the three Hebrew children in died because of the heat. They died. But the three that they threw in didn't even have the smell of smoke or fire on them. You remember the story of Daniel in the lion's den. Hungry lions. <laughs> Daniel fell asleep and slept with the lions. Can I tell you something? That's what God wants today. We're living in a turmoil, uh, a, uh, uh, a time of turmoil. We're living in a time where things are falling apart all around us. And God is looking for men and women who love him, who trust him, who believe in him, who are willing to take a stand and give a clear, strong voice. What we need is God in our lives. What we need is God in our communities. What we need is God in our countries. What we need is God in our churches. Folks, until we start inviting God back into the places that we've told him to get out of, like the schools, like the courts, like our laws, and yes, even sometimes in our churches, it's time to say, dear God, come and fill this place once again. Oh God, I pray that you would give us a new start. I ask that, Lord, you would do something new 
something fresh. I pray that God will give us 2020 vision. You may feel like you've been in captivity for the past several months. You may feel like you've been in the land of Egypt and you're ready for some deliverance. Well, can I tell you, God's your answer. He's the answer to your fears. He's the answer to all your problems. He's the answer to all your difficulties. But it's not until we get totally right with God that we'll see a healing in our land. See, it's easy to blame someone else for all the ills, for all the problems. But we have to take accountability for our own lives. And I wonder today, is there an area that you need to surrender to the Lord? Is there an area that you've kind of taken back? Maybe you've gotten to that point where you said, God, I just soon I was back where I used to be before I got saved. Lord, help you. Or maybe you say, God, I don't like where things are right now. Are you willing to just surrender yourself and say, God, I need you. And if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm here to tell you that, my friend, you need Jesus Christ, and that's the only answer that, and hope that you have is in him. But if you'll trust him today, can I tell you something? You will experience a miracle like you've never experienced before. And you can stand and say, I ain't never been here before. God will give you a fresh perspective of life. He'll give you, he'll give you a life of peace and calmness and blessing. Hey, do you know him today? How great is our God? How great is our God? How great is our God? Is he your God today? If not, if not, will you trust him? Let's pray. Father, Lord, I know these are different days. And I just simply ask that, Lord, you will speak to our hearts in such a fresh and a new way. And Lord, I pray that if anybody is here today that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that today would be the day that they would say, I need Jesus. I see it. My pride, my own self-pity, I've got to get rid of. Lord, I pray that you would just help them to put their trust in you completely as a young child. Fully believing and accepting you. Lord, I pray for those of us who are saved that, Lord, we're not perfect. We've been forgiven of our sins. We, we have our reservation in heaven, but, Lord, we still battle in the flesh. And we still wrestle with the, the, the lust of the flesh and our culture. And God, there may be some who need to turn some things over to you today. There may be some that just need to say, Lord, I'm tired of trying to fight this on my own. And Lord, I pray in this invitation time that your perfect will would be done. Lord, we need you as a church, as a nation, as a community, as a family, but most importantly as a person. Would you come in and take control of our lives like you've never done before so that we can live for you like we've never done before. So that even when we're in a situation of unprecedented times, we can honestly say we've never been here before, but that's okay because God's going to take us where he wants us to go. Help us to trust you. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. This morning we're going to give an invitation. It's going to be a little bit different. But if God is so leading you of a need or a burden, you're welcome to come and kneel at this altar. Or if you need some help, you come and we'll be happy to talk with you and share with you. If you don't feel comfortable about coming right now, then you can call me or text me or you can just let me know I need to talk and we will. But my friend, hear the word of the Lord. Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. That's what I pray all of us will experience today. So if God is calling you today to a decision, maybe God's calling you to come and unite with the fellowship of this church, then I would invite you to do so. Let's stand together and Stephen, lead us in our invitation hymn. Just as I am.
thank you for being here this morning. God bless you. We didn't know what to expect, and so you were a blessing, okay? Amen. Every one of you can go home and say, I was a blessing today. And uh, we hope you'll be back next Sunday. Next Sunday will be basically kind of the same thing, and then we'll kind of determine where things are at. And uh, then we'll try to have some direction and time frames of when we can actually start doing more. But for right now, uh, we're just going to have the worship service next Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. So just be praying. I know, I know it's different. Uh, but let's just consider this an adventure, okay? Uh, and we're just going to make the best of it. Amen? Can we do that? Can we do it with a smile? Okay. And next time you'll know when to get here so you can get your seat back if you'll have to time it when you show up. Now, let me, let me share with you. We did not pass the offering plate, but there are offering boxes as you go out the doors. And you can drop your offering in there and uh, it will be taken instead of passing the plate. So just remember that. Brother Stephen is going to uh, lead you uh, in, a, in a closing song and then give you your dismissal instructions. So listen to Brother Stephen. I'm going to leave and run over to Elliott Hall real quick and say hi to the folks that are over there, okay? Thank God you, bless. Pastor. And while he's going out, we're gonna while we're standing, let us sing together the doxology. After that, I have a, a couple of things to say if we leave. The doxology together, uh, uh, everybody's singing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. All right, you can go ahead and start getting ready to go because we're, we're going to leave uh, in a fashionable order. Uh, before we go, though, let me announce and remind you that Wednesday, the Blood Mobile will be here at the church from noon till 6. So if uh, if you can, blood supplies are, are depleted, and that they could use all the help they could get. Uh, now, we, we promised that before we started this back that we would do our best to, to be uh, socially distancing. Uh, I, I know it is, it's not a great concern to everybody, but while we're here, we need to have the con greatest concern for those that need it the most, okay? So... Uh, just so we don't identify anybody, if we could practice leaving out here with with that social distancing, uh, we're going to start over here. Monica, you, and y'all just get stay six feet behind her. You're going out that door uh, on this side, Dr. Hawkins, if you lead out, and then y'all can just follow, try, try to maintain that distance. Uh, if I find out that you didn't, then next week I'm going to make you sit up here in the choir loft. I'll, all right. And then those of you that are in the